uh, good afternoon or good evening, good morning, depending on wherever you are. Um, I welcome you all to our Eco Civilization talk today. Uh, my name is Jana Fairovit, and um, I work for GM and the Circular Business Academy, and I will be introducing this session today for Yuri. Um, after our interesting talks on communities, today we begin with a new session, the Individuum. And I'm very curious to hear our distinguished guests speak about um, the individuum's role in the eco-civilization. I'm sure that many of you already uh, listened to the short introductory videos by our guests online um, on their view of eco-civilization and its importance. And today we will hear how the individuum can learn and lead in a world of constant change so what the challenges are and where, where are the opportunities um, that we can make the best of. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I would like to make a few short notices. So um, this talk is uh, organized by the Circular Business Academy, NGM, in cooperation with Violeta Boots, the curator of the eco-civilization, and also the leading figure behind this initiative of introducing <coughs> the concept of the eco-civilization. Um, the talk is free of charge, which is due to the funding of the Public Fund for Scholarships and Professional Training of the Republic of Slovenia, and we are very thankful for this. Today's talk is one in a series of <clears throat> um, talks on the eco-civilization that started in spring. And this is our journey to imagine and to discuss the, pos uh, the possible societal implications of this future world. As we see it, um, the transition to an eco-civilization constitutes a paradigm shift. And we would like to engage every single one of you in this discussion. So this is why we ask you to please um, send us your thoughts in form of an essay and we will publish a uh, certificate at the end of the autumn cycle of these talks. For this talk, um, there are some simple ground rules. So please contribute to the conversation. You can do this by raising your hand. And whenever you're not speaking, we do ask you uh, to mute yourself so that uh, you don't interrupt other participants. And as always, this talk is recorded and the materials will be available on our website afterwards. But now, finally, I would like to introduce today's speakers. So we all know Violeta Boots, who is the curator of the eco-civilization and the former EU commissioner for transport. And she's going to be moderating this talk. Um, with us, we have our guests. Um, first of all, Kurt Carlson, who has uh, extensive work experience on innovation and entrepreneurship. He is a professor at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute and Northeastern University, and he teaches value creation and innovation. He also served on President Obama's National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, as a CEO of SRI International in Silicon Valley, um, he worked from 1998 to 2014, and during this time, SRI became a global model for the creation of high-value innovations. His team also won two Emmys, one for HDTV and one for optimized satellite broadcast image quality. And he has also helped um, start over 25 new companies. <laughs> so welcome to this talk. Welcome, Kurt Carlson. We also would like to um, invite Sonia Klopcic, who is with us um, to share her views. She is an engaged developer. Um, of co collaborative le leadership in conscious organizations, as well as a mentor and a coach to executives. She is the author of the Energy Inside Leadership and the AIOU of Leadership. And among many awards for innovations, she recently received a gold award for the model AIOU of Leadership. As CEO, Chair of Board and Crisis Manager, she gained valuable experience in a lot of organizations um, at different stages of their life cycles. Welcome, Sonia. And last but not least, Ramit Singh Chimney also joined us and he started working as a pro bono activist for the empowerment of farmers in Northern India. Now for over a decade, he um, guided strategic and policy inter interventions in the development sector. 
he is a co-founder of the Eight Goals One Foundation, which was recently recognized as an iconic leader creating a better world for all by the Women's Economic Forum. Together with the UNESCO New Delhi Cluster Office, Eight One organizes the FAIR project, which propagates the fairness paradigm that he also developed. Um, he also presents his views at a fora of prestigious universities, among which also Harvard University. So welcome, Ramit. Um, welcome, everyone. We're looking forward to your contributions. And without further ado, I would like to give the word to Violeta Bulls to start this talk. Jana, thank you very much. And uh, a warm welcome from me too. Jana, if you could disengage uh, from the shared screen, it would be great. Um, and uh, we can now engage directly in the conversation. It's been uh, an incredible ride since uh, this spring when we started with these conversations. And uh, it brought so many uh, fresh ideas, bold views, uh, into our circle, because at this point, we really do not have answers, but we have more and more really good questions. And I'm sure that today's conversation will uh, be a strong contributor to exactly that, raising more questions, raising more interest in open uh, cross-planetarian uh, dialogues. And as uh, Kurt said before, there is a lot of different countries present uh, today at this talk. And um, let's uh, help each other. And would you mind just writing in the comment uh, line uh, in a chat, wh which country you're coming from? And uh, we will have that even better view over uh, our audience and um, who is with us uh, today in this virtual uh, dialogue. So uh, without trying to go too much uh, into the broad perspective. Let me just go straight into today's talk. And uh, Jan, I will ask you to just take a look at what's going on in the chat room. And maybe later on, you will share that information with us. Um, as Jan already said, today we are continuing with our discussion on eco-civilization. And uh, today's focus are beings. Today's focus is really individual uh, contribution to the society, to the development uh, stages, to creation of the momentum when things flip. And uh, of course, this is part of the bigger, bigger picture, which uh, we envisioned at this point. This might change completely uh, in the future, but for the sake of our conversation, we created this framework, which has five core entities that we believe should be the essence of uh, civilizational uh, engagement altogether. Uh, not to worry about tools, which we often do, uh, being different economical models, education models, um, stock exchange, technologies, industries, but to really put everything in a relationship of the essential elements that hold life, that create space for life, which are beings, not only humans, but all other beings on this planet Earth, societies that get created uh, with the engagement of these be uh, beings, knowledge and wisdom that uh, is evolved and recognized uh, and uncovered uh, throughout the, the evolution, uh, which I call consciousness, land that holds us, feeds us, and gives us a space within uh, on where we can really uh, cooperate, meet, uh, live, and of course, relationships that glue all this together. And today, the focus is on being. Jan already mentioned that we had an extensive discussions in the last two sessions on communities. We look at the global perspective and from the local perspective. And just briefly, I'd like to share a few of the elements with you because I think they will matter for today's conversation. This is the model that we were addressing in the dialogues. And you can see that beings came in through the purpose and intuition and of course the relationships. And during the discussion, these five key questions started to emerge. 
What brings us together? What keeps us together? Who drives the development and what leads towards new civilizational paradigm? But at the top was all the time this question, who are we? And um, at the end, I tried to pull together a little model, which of course needs more work on it. But the reason why I decided to show it to you, because in spite of the fact that we talked about communities, we actually could not avoid but talking about individuals as well, individual level. Uh, and these are the elements that came through very strongly. Identity, culture, values, emotional relationship, trust, behavior, curiosity and exploration, and vulnerability. And throughout the conversation, I have to say that trust was the most oftenly mentioned. So I put it at the top. So uh, with that in mind, I'll move to today's session. Again, uh, the discussion around the individuum will, be, uh, will emerge around two parts. Today, we will focus on our abilities, abilities to learn, engage, understand, and I'm sure we're gonna broaden the aspect even more than we expect. Uh, and on November 2nd, we will uh, discuss more uh, personal uh, view, which will be the connection within. Uh, we will talk about heart, soul, mind, and higher self, and the way how these dimensions get challenged by all this dynamic, uh, very much unpredictable uh, changes that we are all facing today. Uh, along with the corona crisis, but I think that's just one of the elements because they, it, this corona crisis, of course, coexists or serves on the top of many uh, challenging things like globalization, like climate change, like digitalization, uh, and uh, what's the future really about uh, shared values and uh, currently very unfair redistribution of created value. So all those are big questions within which we sometimes feel so small. We feel that we cannot do anything, but I hope that even today's session will prove how important the individual in all this scheme is and what can we do? How can we position ourselves in order to not only be shuffled around, but actually to, to co-create uh, the wave uh, of life. And uh, with that, uh, just briefly, I'd like to introduce the model that we see on the level of beings. And later on, you will see that one of our uh, guests today uh, largely contributed to what you see today here. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to bring your attention to is really the complexity of beings that exist on this planet Earth. And I dare to claim that humans are just one of them, not superior, but in very much the one who uh, through the level of awareness and consciousness can actually bring a lot of good to this world by acknowledging the coexistence of the entire ecosystem. And of course, uh, our own role within that ecosystem. This topic have, has, has emerged over the years. Uh, and I do recall uh, the early stages uh, in 2006 when we created first models for working with, uh, with the transformation of uh, different organizations. And without knowing how important that really is gonna be in the future, we put the relationship with yourself in the middle of that model. And later on, when uh, through the INCO movement, which is very closely uh, related to one uh, with one of our guests today as well, more about that later, uh, we created also a new view over what can really the what what is the individual and touch the soft parts, and for the first time brought intuition into the business modeling, uh, which was at that time quite a shock. But today it's a common practice and you see it everywhere. But through that we showed, and this is the last uh, picture that I'd like to share is this human, uh, six human dimensions uh, that really opened up the space to uh, 
think not only in our holistic, uh, more spiritual life, but also in a day-to-day -day life, in business life, bring these soft elements strongly on board and understand humans as a complex, holistic being that has, uh, besides physical and intellectual level, a strong emotional, spiritual level, social dimension. And at the end, all that gets reflected in the capacity of the energy that one of us possesses and can then manifest in a day-to-day -day life. And with that in mind, uh, let me turn to our guests. I know you're all very anxious already to, to hear them, to see them, to feel them, like I'm excited too. Uh, and they were already introduced before, but uh, so I will still claim a space uh, when I introduce their core topic uh, to talk with them a little bit about who they actually are. And the first one I'd like to sort of invite on board, if I may say that so, is uh, Kurt. Uh, Kurt is, and I go back about more than 15 years ago, and for many years we kind of uh, lost touch with each other and, and not that long ago, I could say even a few weeks ago, uh, we managed to reconnect via LinkedIn and the sparkle was there. Our first meeting was an hour and a half. Uh, he was rushing to a meeting, I was rushing to a meeting, but we just could not uh, but uh, inform each other about what was going on in the last 15 years. Uh, Kurt, I don't know if you remember this little picture that I'm sharing right now, but this is from Stanford University when we met for the first time and we were training with the little pencils. We were doing this stick game, which I was trying to explain to you that the monks use to calibrate the energies. I mean, that sticked in my mind so strongly because even though you were at that time already the uh, uh, president of Stanford Research Institute, your curiosity and interest in something new was so strong so uh, i could i will always remember that energy uh, that i met at that time and the curiosity that you showed and fun that we had along the conference that was evolving uh, there but uh, it was already mentioned that uh, you're not only a director a manager a, a, a um, professor but you're very much interested also in uh, business in the way how organizations work. Uh, I have to say that my first encounter with the power of your models came through learning about five disciplines of innovation. I was a very successful book that you and your colleague wrote and uh, it in such a simple way uh, really sort of re revealed such a powerful insight into how innovation actually works. And again, I will never remember when you explained that model to me and you said, I have always look in people's eyes and look for sparkles. So with those sparkles in mind, uh, I would like to uh, invite you on board and of course, ask you the first question, uh, which is how are all these changes in our environment really affecting us? How do you feel it? And uh, us individuals, our capacity to learn, um, our absorption capacity, our uh, capacity to act. But let's focus on learning and your observation uh, of us, an individual in this ever dynamic and evolving world. Chris Kurt, the world is yours. Please unmute yourself, Kurt. Uh, thank you for that. That was some introduction. And we did have a love fest when we met. Uh, I, I think we hugged at the end of it. <laughs> so, you're, you're very huggable, that's for sure. And, um, and um, this is a really important uh, topic uh, to discuss, and particularly about you know, where the world is going, what kind of skills people um, need to have, and, and how do we give them those skills? So, um, you know, when I went to SRI, it had been failing for 20 years. It was about to go bankrupt. Um, everybody hated each other because when you're failing, it feels like a world of scarcity. 
not a world of abundance. And you blame everybody else when that happens. And there are parts of the world and parts of um, every country that are like that, and it's very unfortunate. Um, but um, my point of view in this uh, discussion is going to be when you give people the skills, um, it's really quite remarkable uh, what they can do. I mean, it starts with the individuals. It starts with the topic of this um, uh, discussion today is that um, what we discover around the world, it's not just in America, it's in China and in India and in all the places we've worked, is that so many people lack the kinds of skills to make the full contribution they could make. So, for example, the people here today, I, everyone here, I assume, is a value creator. Now, that's a, maybe that's not a word you would use, but everybody here wants to solve problems that will make a contribution to the world. That means basically you're an innovator, you're a value creator. And when you say that, um, you realize it's not just business, it's social engineering, it's um, the environment. Um, all the problems we have require individuals to have the skills to address those big problems uh, that uh, Violetta uh, laid out so nicely. They're all going to be done by people who um, see the opportunities, ask the right questions, as you just said to start off with. That's the, where it all starts with asking the right questions. And then how do you um, work and assemble the teams to be able to solve those problems? So what we've discovered around the world is that very few people have those skills. So the reason I'm now a professor at two universities is I saw what happens to people who have been failing for 20 years when they're given those skills. All of a sudden, they realize they can tackle the big problems of the world, and they can change it for the positive. And whether it's in energy we work in or education um, or in business of various sorts, it really doesn't matter. When you have those skills, uh, you literally um, have the opportunity to tackle those problems in a meaningful way. So then you ask the question, well, if, if our job, if everyone here's job is value creation to solve the world's grand challenges, and if you accept the premise that very few people have those skills, which we can go back to if you want, then the question is, what's the best way to learn? And the best way to learn is, it's got a name, um, it's called different things, but it's basically called active learning. You learn by doing. You only learn by doing. You, people have to be engaged. You have to tap into the passion, the motivations that Violetta also just mentioned, that center. Without engagement, there is no learning. Uh, but with engagement and by doing, repeatedly doing, focusing on the big ideas, I transform people's lives. And that's what I've seen. And I've seen the transformation that makes for people. and. Um, and what it means to them. And those are the people I think that are going to solve some of the big problems we have around the world. So I've now devoted the rest of my life <clears throat> to that challenge of giving people those kinds of skills, whether it's at uh, the elementary school level or whether it's at the graduate school level. How do we all become successful value creators, innovators, so that we can tackle the world's biggest, most important problems? And it starts with the individual. That's the only place it could. It's the only place it can. And it's about finding that empowering force that we all have. OK, Kurt, can I now ask you more specific questions? I already mentioned before your five disciplines of value creation, but you also okay. came up just a couple of years ago, or is it even uh, mm -hmm. younger, with five active learning principles. And yeah. your first learning principle says, iteration with real-time feedback. Why did you yes. put that as the first one? And what does, what does it really mean? Well, the, fir the first one actually above that, and the paragraph above that is engagement. So people mm. have to be engaged first. So once they're engaged, and the way you keep them engaged is by doing the task. So whatever it is, if you want to be a carpenter, you need to be engaged in doing the work. If you want to be a magician, you need to practice <laughs> eight hours a day for, for 15 years or 20 years uh, to become a master um, musician. But it's also true with social engineers and entrepreneurs. So for example, we work a lot with people who want to work on the social side, um, but they don't have the, the skills to put together the teams and form the ventures and do it in a sustainable way. 
so many of the social entrepreneurs we see want to do great things, but they're not permanent. They're not sustainable. And the goal is to make them sustainable. Um, so they have, to, they have to do a lot of work to learn how to do that before they can actually be masters at that. So it's the doing and the overdoing, the doing. And in the doing, it's not just doing and failing. People say it sometimes it's about failing fast. It's not about failing fast, it's learning fast. When you're doing, you also need to be, have the feedback, which is how you get the learning, um, you get the input um, to help you learn fast. So it's doing and learning fast is the name of the game. But inside that, uh, there is one important element that kind of uh, really pleasantly surprised me. And this is the importance of a real-time feedback. What can you yeah. say about that? Well, if it's not real time, you tend to forget it or you ignore it. <laughs> so, so, so yes. So, in all of the work we do, um, it's uh, real time feedback is a is a is a steady feature of it, and it comes from um, from multiple points of view. And none of us are smart enough. Not, nothing I've done, but but I remotely think that I could do by myself. It's just absolutely impossible. I mean, all the things that are on your list, uh, Violetta, are multidisciplinary, if not interdisciplinary. And they take the input of many, many people, sometimes hundreds of people, to have, who have the right perspectives and knowledge to be able to put together um, the innovation that you want to create. So mm -hmm. you, you need to get those multiple feedbacks because you, no matter who you are, you don't know enough. That's and whether, true. So we, we we, we kind of jokingly say that when you start, um, how much do you know? Nothing. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> That's a so, really good start. <laughs> then so, you're really eager to learn, aren't you? <laughs> well, so then, but the question then again is, how do you learn fast enough to be successful? Let's, and, put, and, let's put at this point in your concept of mental models, because okay. I, I found this very innovative as well. Could you explain your motivation behind this important second point? So mental models are basically things that become so set in nature, you don't have to think about them. <clears throat> so again, <clears throat> think of a musician. I mean, if they had to think about where their fingers are going, they couldn't play the cello or the violin or the piano, right? Uh, well, um, uh, working um, on solving problems is uh, have, you, you require similar uh, mental models. So the first one is just um, probably the most obvious to everybody is focusing on the real customer needs, not just the one you might think it is. Figuring out real customer needs is a very hard thing. And you, you can assume as a rule that when people come in to talk to you about a problem they want to solve, they never frame the need correctly. We've done, we've done workshops with 500 teams around the world. No team, no team. <laughs> and these are some of the you know, most, most famous people you could imagine. No team has ever been able to uh, think about the need that they're addressing accurately enough, specifically enough to really be on the right path for the solution. So that kind of thinking, after a while, if you, if you do it often enough, becomes kind of a mental model. So um, my, my teammates now, when people come in and present, they immediately start taking them, we call it from 100,000 feet down to ground uh, level where the real need is. A yeah, very hard to go. Yeah, you're talking about so-called uh, intrinsic uh, knowledge eh? to be Correct. adapted almost automatically so that you have Correct. it at the back. Uh, how, how long does it take to, to develop something like that? To have this um, amazing model in the back of your mind? Um, I would say if you work really hard three years. Mm. Well, that's not kind easy. of corresponds well with the statistics we have, how long it takes for a corporation to make a first more important change. It takes about three right. to five years. Oh, I think I, I think every study will say it's you know it's not it's not a, it's not by going to a workshop or reading a book, you've mm. got to do it, do it and do it, um, and that's why again we we'll go back to motivation, and the individual if they're not passionately committed um, to making that contribution it won't happen and the change won't happen. Two more things, and then I invite people to read about this five active learning principles by themselves. But uh, I I've been intrigued by. by uh, you putting storytelling 
uh, in the description um, of this uh, five active learning day principles. Um, that's one thing. And the other one that uh, people do need frequent comparison. Could you oh. just say a couple of <laughs> words about storytelling and frequent comparison? Yes. Well, so storytelling of some sort or another, uh, we give it various names, bring it to life. But if you're coming up with a big idea, let's say it's a major social innovation, if people can't repeat the idea and why it's going to make a positive difference, obviously you're not going to move forward. So one of the, one of the challenges, particularly when you work with technical people like I do a lot, is they go into all the detail and they forget that other people can't move forward unless they can tell your story. So finding, finding a way to um, tell your story in a way that people just can't forget it. When they hear it, they know it, <laughs> they're not gonna forget it, uh, becomes fundamental um, to making progress. And by the way, with your team and recruiting your team, as well as in getting investments and getting politicians and others to, to listen to you and, um, and make it happen. Uh, the comparison part is a, an interesting part about learning. And it's often forgotten about. I, I would say it's the thing that's missing from most methodologies that I see in a lot of education. One of our great skills as humans is making comparisons. So Violetta, when you, when you have lunch, do you compare the options you have? No, of course. <laughs> what, about, what about a car? When you buy a car, do you compare the options? Well, don't ask me about that. But when okay. I buy glasses, yes. <laughs> okay. okay. But when you do research, you compare data. We, we're comparing the temperature in the room, the lights in the room. We're, we're comparing things all the time. And it turns out that's a really powerful way to learn. So in the methodology that we've developed, that we now teach, that you mentioned, um, the comparison part is really fundamental. So what does that mean? That means when um, the students come into the room and they present their, their value propositions for what they're working on, uh, we use a very simple framework. Um, so nothing, you can't, I don't understand the principle. Any system that's too complicated doesn't work. <laughs> it's gotta be really simple or else people don't do it. So we have a very simple uh, list of questions for them to ask. I mean, they all, um, basically one after the other they present and they get feedback and it goes really fast. So the, there's no delay so you can kind of forget it. But the learning happens, one of the, the powerful ways that learning happens is the students look at one presentation, then they look at the next one, they look at the next one, and they look at the next one. And because they're basically framed in a similar way, they can actually compare, oh, that person really did address the need. Oh, their innovation really does have a sustainable model to it. Oh, that one really does differentiate itself from the competition. So um, it may seem a little abstract here, but boy, I'll tell you, if you can set up a learning environment where that kind of comparative learning takes place, it, it, it looks almost like magic, how fast it goes, because they motivate themselves. You don't have to motivate people. Uh, it's always friendly, but their competitive juices kick in because they want to keep on doing better and better. Um, and most people don't do that. Most people don't do that. They do individual instruction as opposed to this kind of team feedback, uh, which does this comparative learning phenomenon. So it's, it's actually a really big idea that's not used uh, enough anywhere that I can see around the world. Wow, fantastic. Kurt, this was a great introduction to the whole uh, topic of individuum in possible uh, civilizational paradigm. Uh, we will get back to you uh, with some very concrete examples where you were able to use these five active learning principles. But before we do that, let's turn to our next guest and create uh, this wholeness um, of our discussion together with two additional guests. Uh, let me now ask Sonia uh, to join us. And uh, Sonia, I'm always a bit of afraid knowing you so well that I will uh, not present you uh, well enough. I won't be challenging enough with my questions, but uh, uh, I do recall and uh, I will share one screen uh, before we... Uh, we go further, just a second. Um, Sonia and I, besides trying to find the way to express and to bring to Slovenian uh, overall business environment uh, some authentic 
uh, really uh, elements that they can work with, we love to hike together. So this is the picture that you see on the screen um, from one of our hikes. And those hikes uh, always are very in, uh, full of inspiration as well. And we always come home with a bunch of new ideas that then try to manifest them uh, within our own capacities. But uh, Sonia went through the incredible life story uh, from uh, being uh, an engineer. Uh, we met at the university, Electrotechnical University. And then uh, she started soon uh, a career as a manager, uh, went through all the necessary experiences uh, and that manager has to go through from sad to extremely happy and successful stories. Uh, and throughout that, uh, she accumulated uh, a, a rich uh, set of uh, experiences, as Kurt saying, very important. But at the same time, uh, she was always trying to make a step further, build on those experiences and offer something back. So Sonia, it's great to have you with us. And uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on uh, what do you think is the role of individual uh, in this ever-changing world and in, uh, in what is the individual possibility to co-create a change in the world in the future? And what is happening to our capacity to lead, to engage? This is your specialty. Sonia, the, world, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Violeta. I'm really glad to be part of this dialogue today and uh, have the chance to co-create, to add my part to the, this involvement of the idea of eco-civilization. And as Kurt said that everyone is a value creator, I would say that everyone is a leader, at least of her or his own life. But some of us, we have also a greater responsibility, uh, also formal um, position of leading people. And I would start my thinking about how may an individual contribute to this eco-civilization from perhaps a different angle. I would start with a picture. Uh, I will, uh, just a moment, I will share my screen. Do you see it? I'm starting with this picture made, created by a 16 year, year old artist. And this picture for me is a symbol how we are all interdependent and how we are all connected, but looking in different directions, not talking to each other. And this picture for me is a symbol that we need to start discussing, engaging in a dialogue to collectively shape what is the best future for us. And that's why I'm so excited that today is also one of the spaces that we can be engaged in this co-creation. So for me, this picture is also, also a symbol of our children, grandchildren, a wake up call for us. A, start looking each in, uh, uh, in other directions, but start collectively sensing and shaping what is needed for the future. And for this, I think that we need to be aware that not just mindset, we need to cultivate our heart set because heart is usually the one that gives us motivation to do something. And also in the times where we are perhaps forgetting about the climate change because of the coronavirus. But if we start to think about the climate change from the perspective of our grandchildren, then our heart set will lead us 
I believe, into a different direction. We will start to think how to create a decent living conditions for our children and grandchildren on our planet. And perhaps we tend to overlook another set. There's also a consciousness set, a consciousness Universal consciousness now allows us to be co-creator, to really engage, to really lead for the best. And this is something that we need also to cultivate, to nurture. So the complete set, mindset, heart set, consciousness set, and to have this global picture in mind is necessary to start engage in a dialogue and to really um, each of us as individuum uh, to bring to the table our own talents, our own capacity and start creating a clear picture for all of us. Kwanya, let me yes? ask you at this point. This is such a beautifully said is this consciousness set and this global perspective that prompted you into delivering this wisdom from five continents? And what is this wisdom from five continents? Please share it with us. This is, yes, this is consciousness set because I felt that we as individuals now are in a different position to really lead engage and co-create because universal consciousness is also evolving and this gives, gives us the leverage so uh, we need to expand our awareness not just to our local problems but il but start to to look at the world from the global perspective because climate change is something we need to tackle as a humanity, as a one family together, it doesn't help if uh, in one part of the world we are uh, creating um, zero emissions and so on, but on the other part of the world, world we are polluting. That's why, yes. And, and from this perspective, I really created this five-dimensional model uh, of leadership, uh, bringing together the elixirs from five continents. Aroha, for example, meaning leading with love, which is totally different from managing with force. Or ape, meaning leading with systemic view. Or ikigai, living with purpose and mission. Uh, oikos, ekos uh, is pronounced in Greek, uh, meaning creating value for all stakeholders, planet one of them. And Ubuntu, meaning building trust-based relationships. So this is the five dimensional model that I believe that it could serve as a path for each individual. And I was really grateful that you, Violeta, included this model uh, to a model of eco-civilization. That's one of those that I mentioned at the beginning that the, it will be revealed during the interview. Indeed, this is the basis for our being uh, entity. Yes, because I believe that um, our ancestors or indigenous people from five continents, they were much more connected with the nature, with cosmic cycle, with, with the wisdom of the life. And we forgot some of uh, this wisdom and, and we erased some of these connections and th that there's a time to remember again, to bring it back and of course to combine it with the technology, with all the knowledge we have nowadays. So I believe this is something that is contributing to each person. But on the other hand, we have people that are 
leaders of organizations, leaders of countries, leaders of companies, and they have even greater responsibility. Mm. And I believe that they also need to make this change, the transition from um, mindset, heart set, and consciousness set to the transition from the old management school to the new or AEIOU leadership code. So Anya, let it's me a, ask you at this point, yes. because this is mm -hmm. really uh, something that is emerging as a new, fresh view. How are the leaders responding to this? Some of them, they take it as a truth. As each universal truth that when you hear it clearly, you just know it is the truth. Some of them are resistant to this because this old training, uh, old narrative is so still so imprinted in them, but not just in them, it is imprinted also in our society. Mm. We are always talking about competitive uh, competitive advantage uh, for profit for owners, for vision of one person, and so on. From uh, that, all the decisions need to be made uh, at the top, and so on. So this is something that we need to dissolve. There's not. We don't have a switch to to switch it uh, in uh, one moment but uh, we need time and we need some enlightened leaders who will lead the way. Mm. But uh, let me ask you here, because one of your approaches together with your colleague uh, to, to spread this new understanding, this new awareness is through mentorship. And uh, if, you, if we took a deeper look at the five active learning principles, we would see that uh, one, of the details is also employ mentors and not just teachers. And you're also exercising that. Uh, share a little bit the experience of this kind of teaching. Mentoring and coaching um, is very important because it broadens a perspective. For example, to understand uh, how to make the transition from the competitive advantage to uh, work with the mission and purpose. Uh, when I was a coach to a um, leader of one company who was um, involved in a debt collecting, uh, and I offered a broader perspective. What is really their role? in this line of business, if I may say so. And he came with a completely different view. But your collecting. new line of business was? Debt collecting. Now that was the old one. What was the new proposition? The new, the new one was to understand the business as the supporter of the flow of the money. Exactly, that's an incredible shift. And if you understand that your mission is to really do everything to create uh, all the needed in all the needed circumstances that the flow of the money mm. would go through through company through to company, then your your approach is completely different. Mm. This is kind of transformations we are seeking. And, and uh, I believe that each such a transformation sparkles a new transformations in other uh, companies. Mm. <clears throat> this is a, a, a very good uh, opportunity to uh, maybe bring the third, uh, the third guest on board. And then Sonia, I have several more questions for you because I really would like us to discuss what Aroha, what Ep, Ikigai, uh, Ecos, and Ubuntu mean in the environments where you pull them from. So we'll get back to that, but 
let me now move on to our third guest. Uh, and I would like to express my warm welcome to Ramit. Uh, Ramit, we've met just a few weeks ago. I could say that in a very uh, unusual way in one of the summits, uh, web summits in, in India, the World Economic Forum. And soon after you send me an email saying, would you mind joining my young uh, team of um, students and share what you shared at the World Economic Forum uh, with? And uh, of course I said, yes, but I had no clue what I was entering really. I mean, it sounded very exciting and I have to share with the audience that what really attracted me uh, was the fact that you used very unusual uh, introduction to the training that you're offering to your colleagues, uh, to your colleague students. Uh, for a year, you brought together a group of people from the entire India and the only purpose was to expand their minds, to expand their minds, to give them the skills to think and to be able to create within this expanded mind, the future. How can anything be more exciting than that? Uh, Ramit, how did that came about? And how did you, through this engagement with young people experience, uh, this ability to understand. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Willet. I think, uh, you know, just to begin with, first off, uh, I'm just going to take a segue and thank uh, Maya and Rajni for having their cameras on. Because other than the five of us who have to keep their cameras on, it's 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 really heartening to see more more people joining in. Uh, and it's it becomes warm because then we recognize that we're not alone, right? We're, or there are more and more of us who are having these kind of conversations that are just so, so, so important. So thank you, for, thank you, Violetta, um, and to the CBA for organizing this. This is absolutely fantastic. Right. Uh, how did it come about? Um, I'll tell you, Vilata, I think it, it came about a lot from what I was seeing all around me, at least here in India, with the youth, with myself as well, is uh, the fact that we've all seemed to be always running out of time. Right. We always seem to be on a clock and uh, life just needs seems to be moving extremely fast. Right. Um, and at different times, you know, I, I noticed even Kurt and Sonia mentioned this in, in different ways, uh, where Sonia very categorically said that we need time. Change will not happen instantly. There is time that is required. Um, Kurt actually said something which to, to others may have sounded uh, a bit, bit diametrically opposite to that, where he said that we need to think fast and act fast, right? But I think what I really took from everything else that he said around that was the amount of time that he is giving to the people that he is advising and speaking to and uh, trying to motivate, right? Um, and it is about giving that time to our youth because unfortunately, and that's uh, a harsh reality of our world uh, today in which we must understand when we look at positives and we look at how to make change, we must understand what's really uh, troubling our youth today. Um, it is this fast pace of our world where it's difficult to try and move as fast as the world is in alternate directions, right? Because there are certain directions that the world is set for us and we move in that direction and everything moves extremely fast, literally as if we were you know, in a highway with cars whizzing on all sides and you're standing right in the middle. Uh, and while everything is moving so fast, you cannot move. Because if you move, the safest is to just stay still, right? Um, and that's where I realized that a lot of our youth today doesn't have that freedom to move to be able to explore, right? And when move, not just physically, but move in their minds and move their thoughts and so on and so forth, where, where we said, as what you very, very rightly said, it was literally as simple as that, that, uh, you know, let's get together and let's talk. It's all right, we have hours on end. We've got a lot of time, relax. There is no fuss, there is no deliverable at the end of this. It's not that you need to make a presentation and we're working towards that. It's your time and your space, right? Let's talk about the things that you otherwise can't talk about, right? Or are unable to talk about. Um, and what was wonderful, Violetta, really, is, is that we realize a lot of the reasons why the youth does not speak as much as it does, right? About themselves, about their, their real thoughts, uh, why they tend to follow certain ideologies and certain thought processes, right? Uh, even though for a large part, it may not really be their own thought process, right? And I think just that entire recognition was absolutely fantastic. Um, and 
if, if you don't mind, I would want to share some of some of the things yes, that please, please. Because I really, that momentum when you told the students, hey, you're going to spend a year together just to expand your minds. I mean, how incredibly different that is. We didn't even expect that we'd get any applications out to be, to be very honest, right? But because who wants to spend time talking about being fair and being having these conversations about a better world and fairer world, which is not really leading to something because it wasn't linked to business. It wasn't that, oh, let's create more sustainable businesses. It wasn't linked to that employment, or oh, we'll make sure that you become more employable at the end of the day. Right? There was really no end objective, if you were talking about, except for just being better human beings, being more thoughtful. Um, and then to have so many people come in, uh, and frankly, they didn't, they, it, it, it didn't seem out of place at all because they wanted that opportunity. And that's what I realized that we, we were wondering that will we actually get as many applications as we did? But the reality is they're all looking for an outlet. They're all looking for an opportunity to be able to present themselves because, uh, and this is this, these are the fun, these are the thoughts that actually ended up coming and uh, that get what developed along the way as to why they've not been able to do that, right? Um, it all actually starts um, with right when they were children, right? And I think this is something that I keep talking about a lot after, for the last one year is that. And just in terms of eco-civilization as well, we, we, you showed us that entire link between the world and the individual with the communities in the middle, but then the fact that there is this entire scope. Uh, but how are we taught about our world in the first place, right? Um, for those of you who'd remember back in whatever grade one, grade two, whenever it is that you were told about the world, you were told about the world through maps and globes, right? Now, do we recognize what's actually happening there? What's actually happening is that we are being taught about our world through these lines that are on these maps and these globes, which actually don't exist, right? And that's what we're seeing. So when we understand the world, we see it with these boundaries and with these divisions and all of these various other uh, di dichotomous positions that are, uh, that are present in our world today. And that forms a blueprint for the rest of our lives. Because for everything else, we're looking at things within with these boundaries and with these trying to find limitations, saying, you know, what's the limit to this? And then even when we are talking about innovation, we talk about let's cross the limit. But who's decided this limit in the first place, right? Um, and that just becomes a way that people start uh, looking at things when they were younger and when they when they grow up when they become young adults, uh, it it becomes even more because the stereotypes increase, mm -hmm. right? Ends up happening is that we start talking to people about, oh, are you X or are you Y? Are you left wing? Are you right wing? Are you a Hindu? Are you a Christian? Right? Mm -hmm. All of these kind of concepts start coming about where we're given options, and those options are presented to us and said, "Then now choose which which one is it?" Right? And then uh, at the end of the day, what you'll end up being is either a conformist or a rebel. Right? Yeah. Where where can you really be yourself? Because you're choosing something that the world has given to you, and you're choosing from that. But are you really asking yourself what you are? And I'll, just in terms of religion, I'll give you that example. Right? Um, I am neither a theist nor an atheist, right? Now, what people end up assuming is that I'm agnostic, because again, that those are the terminologies that people end up using. But um, an agnostic is someone who uh, who doesn't care, right? I care. I want to know whether God exists or not. It's just that I don't know right now. I don't think anyone's given me a compelling argument one way or the other. But I really want to know. The closest I'll probably come to it, and again, in terms of stereotypes and, and tags that we get, is is this concept that I heard recently about being a seeker agnostic, right? <laughs> It just it, it amazes me as we keep coming up with these tags, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not even that because a seeker agnostic that then I understood was someone who doesn't believe in God but would really want to because then he wants to tie in with the rest of society. But I'm not that either. So. I mean, let me jump in here because I think um, in in our previous discussions on communities, this identity uh, came very strongly through. But the way how we were able to uh, explore this identity was actually beyond the text. Yeah, so uh, maybe this is part of the historic sort of frameworks, which we just need to get out of, because if we acknowledge humans through all these six dimensions that I shared uh, with all of us before, then there is no labeling. It's a dynamic stage of expanding all our six senses and six dimensions. And that's where the beauty is. So. Have you seen these changes in the youth? Because you were uh, taking them uh, through different discussions throughout the entire year and the, the cycle is over. What did you realize or learn at the end? How did their understanding expand? 
So I think one of one of the most heartening parts of this entire exercise, Violetta, was the fact that most of us, right, I, almost all of us, changed our minds multiple times, right? And, uh, you know, when you say it out to the rest of the world, and I just said it out right now, it just seems that, oh, well, does that mean that we were fickle-minded? Does it mean that we were not sure of ourselves? Does it mean that uh, we didn't do adequate research to come up with an opinion, right? But that really wasn't it. The idea always was that at that point of time, right, keeping certain core principles in mind, like the principles that you've got for eco-civilization, what are the positions that you hold at that point of time? Mm. Now, if circumstances changes and if things change, if there are more things that you understand, you develop, your mindset develops, your understanding develops, right? Why should you not be able to change your mind? Right? Mm -hmm. Why should you then be uh, blocked down by something that you had said previously? And it's it's not a bad thing. Again, people keep talking about, you know, those uh, people living in glass houses shouldn't store thorns, uh, practice what you preach, you know, those kind of concepts, which are very positive concepts, right? But they're also limiting to an extent because uh, they make us stick on to what we said. And I, I saw, you know, most of us, we, we started, I'll give you a quick example about uh, India just came up with a new education policy and education is as important as it is, even in this conversation. And there were a lot of us who were up in arms about the education policy. Uh, then we started reading it more and we started understanding. We started understanding what's actually going on. We started liking it, supporting it, right? Mm -hmm. Then again, we suddenly realized a particular angle that we hadn't seen before because someone talked to us about it and said that, you know, okay, but this is also what's happening. And then we suddenly realized that, oh no, guess what? But that this is a consequence. We have to be aware of this consequence, right? Mm -hmm. That sort of an evolution, I think is very, very natural. It is human, it is evolution. And uh, just the way that we have evolved as human beings over all these years, we have to let our minds evolve and we can't stop us, our minds from evolving. It's, it's extremely crucial so that, that all of us understand that our mind will always be ever evolving. Mm. Uh, do you recall any of the responses that the students gave you? And just for the sake of understanding, uh, besides me, how many speakers did you have in this uh, cycle uh, of the first year? And um, I do recall the, the, the way how I felt when I met your students at the end of this cycle. Uh, it was really hard to keep up with them. They were extremely open. I did not expect, you know, uh, especially women from India as well to be so open and, and, and the boys being so respectful towards uh, lady colleagues and uh, just the way how their uh, questions were like really coming from some sort of global awareness already. So uh, I said at the end, I don't think I've ever been so strict in front of anyone than in front of these kids because the questions were straight to the point. So what were their reactions? Were they aware of their development? Um, so I, I think that's a tricky bit, I think, because at the end of the day, I think all of us collectively agreed that uh, we've just got a long way to go, right? Mm -hmm. I think. We're just at the start of this, right? Again, all of them are happy to come back next year. All of them want to be doing these things for themselves, for people in their communities, in their schools, colleges, uh, um, and their workplaces and all of that, right? But uh, I'll tell you, you know, just because you mentioned our interaction, uh, I will tell you the, the other side, their side of it as well. They were in awe of you, Violetta, right? You gave us almost three hours, right, uh, of your time. And frankly, I think um, you were you were so much at ease in that conversation. And while you're saying you're saying all these things about being astonished about them, but what they loved is that you were you were so accommodating. You were willing to give them time. You were willing to talk to them. You weren't ignoring any question. You weren't uh, making your point. You were always trying to understand their point and speak about that, right? Uh, and again, coming back to the to original thing is if people need to give time to the youth and to everyone else around you. And, and the fact that you did that was fantastic for them. And, uh, but no, in terms of reactions, I will tell you, uh, tell you this, right? I think they all recognize uh, the practical aspects of the fact that they will be going on and working at different companies and corporations and so on and so forth. They recognize that they'll be doing different varied kind of things, right? Um, but what is heartening again, and, as I, and I think I mentioned this before as well, is that at least now they will think more about the things that they're doing, right? And at least now that the conversations that they will have with, will be with people as what you witnessed will not merely be, okay, so let me hear what you have to say. No, I want to engage in dialogue. I want to understand why is it that you're saying what you're saying? Sure, fair enough. Maybe you're absolutely correct. Maybe you're 100% correct, but I still want to dig deeper, right? If I don't understand it for myself, merely saying that I agree with you is not enough, 
right? Because then if I agree with you, I need to be able to speak to somebody else and make them agree as well. And then so on and so forth, right? Until the time I don't have active dialogue, I will not be able to do this. And that's that's probably the one takeaway that I really like. One of, one of, the, one of the students has started their own podcast uh so they've they've gone they've, they've i think they've they've done more podcasts than we have <laughs> so which is fantastic well, that is fantastic news student always has to go broader and higher than the teacher so that's great that's a compliment to you uh, absolutely and it was, it's a lot of fun and a lot of others have, have expressed their interest in, in working with us for the next uh, six to 12 months uh, over their weekends because they want to do more they want to develop more courses around this and uh, all of them just are excited again, like I said, to have these conversations because guess what? This is what is lacking today, uh, which is what you're fulfilling right now as well by having these conversations right now. Fantastic. Um, while you were talking, I saw Sonia nodding a lot. And uh, I, I think uh, we need to give her a chance to uh, comment. But at the same time, Sonia, I would ask you a question. Can you relate to what? Uh, uh, what uh, Ramit was sharing with us. And uh, can you see this kind of uh, characteristics also in the leadership? And please unmute yourself. Yes. yes. It was really great listening to this process, Ramit. And I really imagined a team of really curious, creative, uh, uh, people uh, expanding expanding their awareness so great and yes it's not enough uh, that you say i agree it needs to be really digested it needs to be really deeply comprehended and embodied not just understood but embodied and then you can share this message with others. And um, in relation with leadership, this means, yes, you got uh, 30 or how many people, uh, new leaders for the future and wherever or whatever they will be doing, they, they will create a better place for all. I, I really, I'm sure about it. And I would create, I would correlate this very much with two dimensions of uh, the AEIOU. One would be with Ubuntu. Ubuntu, I am who I am because you are who you are. I am because we are. And to understand that uh, we need other people and to be engaged in a dialogue with other people, to create also ourselves. This would be one and another with Aroha, Aroha, a Maori word for love and empathy, and also generosity. This is, I felt that this was really a connection with uh, the team. You uh, had the potential to support. Thank you. Super. Sonia, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to now go to back to Kurt. Kurt, uh, there are some questions already for you in the chat. And uh, I would uh, invite uh, the, uh, Aditya uh, Awashi to raise it, to uh, raise it openly. Uh, and uh, Kurt, you will be invited to reply. But before we go there, Jana, could you just share with us the information? Where are all these beautiful people coming from? Oh, they are coming from uh, lots of different places, actually. Um, let me see. We have Serbia, we have Norway, we have Slovenia, Russia, India, Zimbabwe, Germany, and Croatia. And California. Yes, of course, this is, uh, <laughs> excluding our panelists. <laughs> So yeah, okay. there is a colorful bunch. <laughs> Super, Probably. thank you very much. And we have a lot of uh, questions actually, so um, yeah. please go ahead. Uh, let's start. Jana, if you have a control over who raised the question first, I already invited uh, uh, our colleague. I think uh, she's from Zimbabwe. 
and uh, she can raise the question first and then let's go uh, one by one the way how they came on and i would okay. ask yana you to, uh, to to take care of the <laughs> order thank you very much but let's start with the first question to kurt Just unmute yourself, please, and go ahead. Say it loud. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am sitting here in utter awe because this is completely a different world. Um, where I am, I am a scholar of Ubuntu, and I believe um, I am because we are. I strongly believe that. However, I have... Um, what troubles me, and this is across all the panelists, is how do you actualize this in a very difficult world, particularly when you look at the post-COVID era where everyone is really struggling to just find who they are? How do you remind the world that we need together to be? Thank you very much. Sure go ahead. Oh, what, a, what a great question, because that really is the issue. It's not just the what, it's the how. And most people focus on the what and not the how. Now, just uh, uh, I want to come back to that. But first, I want to tie the, uh, what Sonia and um, uh, Ramit said together, because I, I, I resonated very strongly with both of them. Um, with Sonia, her list of um, leadership characteristics actually is a major movement around the world. So I just was part of the World Agile Conference and everyone is struggling to move that way. I was just at the director forum and the a guy who runs uh, General Electric uh, Appliances actually would, would agree with every one of your principles and he's completely transformed that company, completely. Uh, you know, you think that's a, a business that left America a hundred years ago. No, he's winning and his people are engaged and what have you. I would say your word, your word love is a little, probably a little strong for most CEOs. So, um, but empathy, involvement, respect, those human characteristics are fundamental to the new management that we see around the world. Kurt, Kurt, do you want to say that love is not fundamental to human being? I do. I'm just saying that it's a strong word for a CEO. <laughs> And I actually believe in it. Um, if you asked me if I loved my people at Esther, I, I, would, I would easily say yes. I, I mean, no, no doubt about it. Um, I put my employees first above everything else and I did, I loved them. And I, I, my, um, so I, I agree with her. I'm just saying that yes, for yes. each audience, there's a way to say these things that resonates uh, better. I'm uh, back to Ramato for a second because, um, you know, uh, the kind of empowerment he was building into those teams is exactly what I was trying to describe as well. And that kind of engagement, it's, I mean, it's intense when I'm sure when you brought those students together, the discussion is going like crazy, right? So it's exactly what I was talking about. It's that kind of rapid involvement because they really are engaged. And back to the question, um, if you have to put those ingredients together, if you can put those ingredients together, it's amazing what happens. So um, um, in business, um, you know, you might think uh, like my example of GE in an appliance business, like, how do you do that? That seems crazy. You know, what's a, it's such a hard nosed business, but because the CEO had those attitudes and those values, he actually instilled them and he gave up all the power things that normally you think about with a CEO in those kinds of positions. He just flipped it on its head. And he pushed all the authority down to the bottom, where again, going back to Ramit, where the people could be engaged and work together and create that sense of community that you were describing so well, beautifully, by the way. Um, so you can do it, but it takes a different mindset to do it. So that's, I mean, that's what this discussion is about is realizing that if you give up a lot of those power tools that you think you have, you can actually make this work and your people will be engaged and you'll be more successful as a business. It seems like a paradox, but it's not. Mm. I hope uh, that that answered the question. Thank you very much. It was very clear and straightforward. But uh, Jana, who's next? So the first uh, is actually a comment from Martina. Um, she was um, 
saying about your concept of eco-civilization um, to think about the inclusion of fungi and algae as they represent their own kingdom of beings. So, yeah, I saw that comment and yeah. uh, thank you very much. Definitely, we are adding it to the whole family of beings on this planet Earth. As I said, the whole model is in evolutionary phase and at the end, we will co-create it. So this is a very important little addition. Thank you very much. Then we have a very practical question from Dimitri to everyone. Um, his question is about mass psychology and tendencies and how we can implement a simple waste separation system in countries, whether we need the government to be active here and um, what the right psychology behind it might be. So um, is it to um, reward people who uh, do this or is it to punish those who don't? Well, that is a question I would like now to ask our three guests to reply to it from their three different angles. It's a question of circular economy, but all everything we've heard today, um, it, it's very applicable. So Kurt, from the capacity to learn, how can we attack that problem better? From the capacity to understand Ramit, how can we uh, engage better? And Sonia, from the capacity of leadership, how can we engage better in order to get this done? Please. I, I always want to start with a big idea, a big positive idea. I, I hate using a force and authority to make the case. And usually there is a big idea. Um, and if you can come up with it, then you can engage people. And, and most people, again, jump too quickly to the power tools and to their, you know, this, I'm right and you're wrong uh, without that dialogue. So that I... Um, I, I'm always looking for the big idea. What's the big idea that will move the world forward? Thanks, Ramit. So, I mean, from my perspective, it's it's about realization, right? I think um, to a large part of the world, and I speak a lot about India and, and people around me, uh, they don't understand what the repercussions of um, not separating your garbage is, right? And again, we, we understand, we keep talking about, oh, uh, pl the plastic island uh, in the Pacific Ocean is one of the largest in the world and so on and so forth. But these are very big picture things that don't really, that we don't see with our own very eyes, right? I think uh, the moment we need to trust human beings a bit more, right? Uh, and if they realize the consequences and they're shown the consequences, we take the time to explain to them the consequences um, of not segregating your waste. I think you'll see a lot more people change because at least I'll say it from my experience, uh, anyone that I have, and we speak a lot about waste as well, uh, waste management, and uh, anyone that we've explained the actual consequences thereof, you see that change happen because they've actually, they recognize it, they see it, it's not top level, it's in front of their eyes and uh, then it's very hard to take your eyes away from that. Um, and I think trusting humans with this information where they can make up their own mind and, and or do this of their own volition is wonderful. And as I, as Kurt said, I just want to um, reiterate that, that this, the iron fist concept just doesn't work beyond, right? It just doesn't, right? Uh, you can't force people or compel people in, in things like this. It has to come from within. For that, you need to empower them, give them the knowledge and um, wonders can happen. Thank you, Sonia. Yes. Children are, are great leaders here. And if we uh, work with children, as for example, here in Slovenia, in kindergartens, uh, children know very well why we need to separate, separate our garbage. Mm -hmm. And then in their families, they are the one that are leading their parents. Mm -hmm. So this is simple. Uh, solution from the leadership point of view. So Oikos will work here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jana, back to you. Okay, then we have um, a question from Matyash. He already had to leave, but he was really interested in the discussion and hopes to get an answer. Um, and it was actually backed up by a comment from Barbara. So Matyash, um, says, does it make sense to invest so much into artificial intelligence, intelligence, machine learning, modern technology, um, when there is still so much traditional knowledge and wisdom that is almost forgotten or may die out? This relates to what Sonia said, I believe. And Barbara added, the real challenge is to combine the two worlds, organic, sustainable, reusable, including traditional experience, and then link it with the digital world. So what are your comments on that? Well, thank you very much. And Kurt, you are from Silicon Valley. 
And so you're sitting at the heart of the emergence of artificial intelligence uh, solutions. Yeah. So what's your take on yeah. it? Well, indeed, we you know we created Siri that's now on the iPhone, so we're we're certainly in the middle of this. Yes, we're certainly in the middle of this. Well, I mean, there are two answers, I guess. One answer is um, it's you, it's going to go on. So even if you thought it was uh, the worst thing in the world, it's going to be very hard to stop. I think again, it's it's this flip that the other two speakers are talking about is how you think about these things and how you use them. So for example, here in California, 80% of black children fail basic math and reading every year. Uh, California is a very progressive place. I mean, it's almost a socialist you know, country in America. <laughs> Everybody says they care about these children, but uh, nothing happens. Um, and, but uh, some of the work that we've been doing is how do you actually use these technologies to actually help these poor children who are basically being cut out of the future we're all talking about so just here. for clarification, so, it's a, it's always, so you're talking about uh, computer tools, so digital tools that support yes. uh, art of um, the, the, the active learning techniques. Okay. Correct. And it, it really is active learning. So again, all the things we talked about, engagement, community, teams, feedback, all those things uh, can be brought together in new ways. Um, and, you know, we were not there yet. But I'm just pointing out that all these things are flips. You, there's things we really don't like. There are a lot of things about social media that are terrible. But there's also the flip side of that that is uh, helping us solve some of the biggest problems in the world. And for me, one of the biggest problems all around the world is education. That's really fundamental. Without that, uh, it's so hard. Uh, and in, in America, for black children, it's just terrible, terrible. Well, Really good luck with your tools because you shared with me some exciting uh, results already, and uh, also with students and professors. Uh, so um, let's let's continue this dialogue on on active learning because uh, there is something emerging which I also feel that can contribute to a more open and more engaging world. But Remit, do you remember uh, in our discussion with students, I asked them if they know when the concept of internet was uh, for the first time created now. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, of course, uh, I, I had similar experience with my students um, all over. And usually they go back to, let's say, 1956 when ENIAC was created. And then they say that was a big <laughs> movement. Yeah, but uh, in fact, uh, the concept is goes all the way back 3,500 years before Christ, and we saw it in the in the uh, drawings of the Indian gods. And I remember at that time I explored with your students a thought that maybe we need the internet to see how much we know, to see how much we can do, because all of a sudden everything is available to everyone, and probably internet is by far the most democratic tool ever developed in the history of humankind. So um, how would you respond uh, to, to this uh, question and uh, in the format of really uh, tools, technical digital tools helping us to acknowledge, to understand, to learn, but at the same time, do you think at one point we will be able to just drop it because we will be able to develop other means of sharing, engaging, What's your take on that? So I'll tell you, Vilesh, and I think just to matters and, and to what Kurt said as well, I think uh, I personally have always been a very, very major uh, skeptic of technology, right? Uh, majorly so. And that's not because I'm anti-development or I don't, I don't want to unleash the power of the human mind and so on and so forth. But it's the direction that technology ends up taking is what I really uh, always worry about, right? Um, and just the way what Kurt explained right now, that is how technology is, needs to be. We're all smart enough, right? No one is doubting the intelligence levels of, of, of human beings to be able to create, to be able to develop, to be able to make AI work. But the real question is, what will it be utilized for, right? And that is where I think we just need to make sure, all of us just need to make sure that we are 
pointing our efforts, our growth, our progress, the speed at which we are growing in the right direction, right? Uh, and it may not always be possible. It's absolutely okay. But then we need to then empower those individuals who are trying to make it move in that direction. Like Kurt, Kurt mentioned absolutely uh, perfectly that the real thing that AI and ML that uh, Martez was talking about can solve is education. And that's so much needed in our world today, right? But we need to empower those companies, those individuals who are taking AI in that direction, right? Uh, while being a bit aware, of uh, the other alternate directions that AI has already gone to and, and can potentially go to. And, and that's the balance that we really need to try and find and create in our world, which is a little, little difficult, but I'm sure with the kind of thought processes uh, sitting in Silicon Valley of one uh, of whom one Kurt is uh, with us right now, uh, we will end up finding, finding those directions. There'll be more of us who'll be able to find that direction. So uh, I don't know whether that answers your question, Violetta, but I really wanted to get that in with respect to what you said. <laughs> Go ahead, oh, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, that leads me to, to, to expand this question even more with Sonia. I think that there is one element from your IOU model, which is um, Ikigai, that we have not uh, really uh, zoomed in uh, on. So what do you think? How, how, what is the role of leadership in uh, bringing the best out of technology? And does that have anything to do with reason for being? Please. Oh, this is a, a really tough question. Um, if I will would split it to two questions. Um, first, about technology, artificial intelligence. Um, I would say, and and uh, the question was before, uh, what about the this uh, ancient wisdom? We need both. <laughs> We need both because in times of big data, internet of things, uh, we are, don't have enough capacity and time to, <laughs> to really understand and comprehend all the connections between the things. And that's why we need artificial intelligence. But on the other hand, uh, we need the wisdom how we will use artificial intelligence. Uh, because it may narrow our view, <laughs> mm. and that's why, uh, uh, and it mm. may affect our uh, mindset. <laughs> mm. That's why uh, we need both wisdom and uh, artificial intelligence, and um, the role of leaders in managers in this is to really insist to insist to instill this wisdom to the AE, A, A, AI and uh, to understand how can AI uh, leverage their business models? Mm -hmm. how, they, how can they benefit out of it? And to connect this uh, with Ikigai, which is really <laughs> a, a very interesting combination Ikigai means uh, life with a purpose, life with a reason, and also work with a mission. Uh, so uh, that's exactly, Sonia, what I had in mind. Yes. That is exactly the one, because yes, we, we it, do it technologies is, with the mission, with the purpose yes. from our hearts, then it will be right. And Don't this is, so? yes, the, this is the right path. Uh, what is the mission and what is the purpose and what can, su can support to really deliver mm. this? Super. Okay. Mm. Uh, we are almost done. Uh, the, we set 90 minutes and we have to stick uh, with our schedule even though that questions are uh, popping up. Uh, uh, but I would take the last question that was raised by Maya Tushke. And uh, Jana, go ahead, let's, uh, let's take a look at that question too. And uh, while we are listening to it, I would like to ask our three guests uh, to also uh, take this question and uh, try to also link uh, your own contribution today, your own work to possibility of the emergence of new civilizational paradigm. Can you feel it? Is it a very 
scary or too bold of a statement? Or can you feel that there is enough sort of uh, new things evolving that we could expect a bigger change in our awareness, consequently consciousness, and consequently a new value set uh, which will lead to a new civilizational paradigm. But let's start with Maya's question. Maya would like to know, how do we create planetary consciousness and plant enough healthy seeds to create respectful and cooperative communication? Um, in this way, is it important uh, or in, how is it important to define crucial knowledge for the future and make our school innovative? Let's start with Sonia now and we'll go backwards. Sonia, go ahead. Uh, that relates partially to your work as well. I believe that planetary consciousness is created. It's already there. We need to um, adjust ourselves to really be able to connect and to synchronize. And this is the work of each individual to do. And uh, what was the other part of the question? The part was also, how do you feel, do, are we creating enough uh, awareness and congestion of new emerging elements to, uh, to see really uh, the development towards new civilizational okay. paradigm? Okay, yes, uh, I said, uh, the work of each individual and when we will have this uh, enough number of individuals that will be able to really synchronize with universal consciousness and to synchronize to each other, then this change will happen. So I think we are here on the move, individuals, now everything else is set already. Let's keep walking this path. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Ramit, what do you think? So um, I'll, I'll be very honest with everybody. It's an extremely difficult task, right? I think we need to recognize how difficult it is. And once we recognize how difficult it is, we will put in all the effort to make it happen, right? So can it happen? 110% it can happen, right? If that was a possibility. Mm. But uh, without re recognizing how difficult mm -hmm. it is, without Recognizing that there are a lot of people in our world who are motivated with the reverse of what we're talking of right now, right? Uh, and they will always have uh, motivation that can sustain them, right? We need to make sure that our motivation also sustains us, right? Where these conversations are not one-off, these conversations are not a single dialogue. There are more and more of these dialogues that we all help create all over our world, right? Uh, whether it's in our own houses, whether it's on a global scale, like you've done, Violetta, um, or wherever it is, right? As long as we continue to have these conversations, and as what Maya said as well, right? I think she's, she's talking about creating respectful and cooperative communication. The key part of that is communication. And I honestly believe um, language has lots of forms. It's not just the words that we speak. Um, if, I, if you're sitting with somebody who doesn't speak your language and in their homes, you will find a way to connect if you're, if you're willing to communicate, right? And that's what all of us need to do. And we can, it's difficult, but it is definitely achievable if we all get to it and keep at it. So keep at it, everyone. That's, that's really what I'd like to say. Thank you very much, Rami. And Kurt, now we started with you. We will uh, finish this uh, conversation with you as well. So what's your take on all this? Well, I think it's happening. Um, the groups that I belong to um, are having these discussions now in a way that didn't happen even five years ago. Uh, when you go to the World Agile Conference, and this is the topic with companies all over the world, uh, that's a, a change. Uh, Sonia's Great List, which would have seemed absolutely kind of crazy 10 years ago, um, with a few words maybe uh, moved around, but that's on, the, that's on the table in every one of those meetings I go into, is how do you empower people to be more productive and have more meaningful lives? So I would say it's happening. Uh, I say a good word for technology. Uh, we can't solve the problems of the environment or um, uh, poverty or education without technology. It's not gonna scale fast enough to make the impact. Uh, the good news is, even though we're, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at this environmental issue that's uh, horrifying in the extreme, 
Uh, innovation is actually going to solve that problem eventually. Uh, the solutions have already been identified and where people are working on them. So uh, that's the good news on that side. I um, mean, you think about this technology we're using right now, this, this is still a very primitive technology. Mm -hmm. Imagine this technology 10 or 15 years ago and the level of collaboration that's going to be possible between any place in the world and the worst parts of Africa or India where people were just you know, desperate for knowledge and for education. It's going to basically make the world transparent. I often talk about the transparent world and we're going into that. So this discussion is just gonna keep on being amplified. So I, I think there's a, a lot of um, great uh, progress. I see it in the education schools that I, I'm part of. Um, active learning though, I think is part of it. It's this engagement in doing and doing and doing. Uh, that's how you get people to have the right skills, the right values that uh, Sonia and um, Robert um, mentioned. Uh, and it's, it's going on, it's just slower than anybody wants, that's all. <laughs> it's a lot slower than we want. That's why we're here, right? <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you to Kurt, to Ramit and Sonia. Uh, this was a very broad, engaging and very uh, future and today oriented discussion. Uh, I'm happy because uh, the topic individuum and eco-civilization is yet another topic which is expanding our minds. As, uh, as many uh, philosophers often say, once you expand your mind, you create space within which you can engage. So broader your mind, broader the space for engagement. So I do hope that uh, we have done a bit of that today. Uh, I'm so grateful to all of you who joined us uh, from all continents uh, of this beautiful planet Earth. And uh, don't forget, uh, November 2nd, we continue discussions on individual and eco-civilization. This time we will take a look uh, inside the human being uh, with some very interesting guests. I'm not gonna reveal them yet. So please check our emails and uh, posts on social media to learn who these guests are. But uh, I certainly hope that our today's guests will stay part of our uh, community uh, we will keep you informed, guys. Uh, you're always welcome to join us, and we hope to have you back in even more provocative engagement because <laughs> simply, as Jukert said, we're going to know more. So thank you very much to everyone, and be safe, be healthy, and keep creating. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also from my side, thank you for joining today, and check out the website. and. Um, inform yourself about the topic and the speakers. Um, thank you for today. And today's discussion will be published uh, in a matter of hours uh, on the web pages, again, on CBA and on the Eco-Civilization page uh, and conversation continues. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.